Today we're going to be talking about the three certainties uh, required to create an express trust in trust law. More specifically, we're going to be learning about the certainty of subject matter. And this requires that the identity of the assets is sufficiently certain and that the beneficial interest is clear in order to create this express trust. And this, as you can imagine, is easier when the asset is transferred because it is clear which asset must be held on trust. This is more difficult when the asset has not yet been transferred, as is in the case of testamentary trusts. So if there are ambiguities to the will. So we will be going through the case law and we will be starting at Spranger versus Barnard in 1789. In this case, the wording used was the remaining part of what is left. And the court said that this was too vague to identify which asset the trust should concern. However, it is very important to note that if everything else, every other provision of the will is stated as a sum, then saying what is left is definitive enough. So this problem of ambiguity that arose in Spranger only arises when it is unclear how the rest of the will should be divided and one cannot simply calculate what is the rest. So, for example, in a problem question, you may receive multiple provisions of a will and if they are all stated as clear sums and the last one states what is left, this will be definitively certain enough. So, moving on to Peck versus Halsey in 1720, in this case, the wording some of my best linen was held by the court to be too uncertain um, as certainty of subject matter and no trust could be created. This is quite intuitive. Um, if we look at the wording best linen, this is not best is not very quantifiable. So best could be in terms of um, most economically valuable, but it could also be most sentimental, uh, sentimentally valuable or aesthetically valuable. So it is very contentious and therefore no trust could be created. Similar situation in Palmer versus Simmons 1854, when the wording used was the bulk of my residuary estate. And in this case, again, the court held that it was too vague to identify the trust property. However, in the case we last in 1958, in this case, a sister left all of her property to her brother but she stated that when the brother dies, all property that is left, that was from her originally, was supposed to go to her late husband's grandchildren. So this meant he could spend it as long as he wished for his lifetime, but if there was anything left um, after he died, it had to be passed on specifically to her late husband's grandchildren. So on the face, this looks much too uncertain to form a certainty of subject matter and to form a trust. But the courts held that the wording was actually enough to cut down the brother's entitlement from absolute entitlement to only a life interest. So he could enjoy it throughout his lifetime, but he could not, for example, sell it because he had to remember that at the end, whatever was left had to go to her late husband's grandchildren. However, um, important with this case is to take into consideration that the, when the brother died, he did not have a next of a kin. He didn't have um, people who would have inherited um, under his estate. Um, and he also did not make a, a will. So therefore, his property would have gone bona vacantia back to the crown. So we have to take into consideration that this would have affected the court's decision. Um, but um, nevertheless, the ratio was that in this situation, his interest was cut down to a life interest. So next, Curtis versus Ripon, 1820. In this case, the courts considered the possibility that a person is intended to be trustee of part, but also to receive another part of an asset as a gift. So in this case, a widow was given all of the property of her husband, who died, sadly, and 
This was subject to a trust that stated, use the property for her spiritual and temporal good and that of the children, remembering always according to the church of God and the poor. So it was held that it was too uncertain which part was hers as an absolute gift and which part was for the children and the church and the poor under this um, supposed trust. So the rule here was that because she did have undoubtedly a benefit and that she was supposed to receive part as an absolute gift, it was said that she would receive the entire property as an absolute gift, which meant that she could use the property in any way she wished and she would not be bound technically to consider the poor and the church of God, except for her moral obligation towards her husband, not anything legal. So moving on from this case to the case of Doily in 1735, this case states that when it is not apparent how assets shall be split, the equitable maxim equity is equality takes charge and this means that the assets are split equally. So this means that a fixed trust will arise. The trustees in the case will not have a discretion as to how to distribute the assets if the testator has not stated any discretion and equity states that every person in title should receive the same amount. This makes sense. So moving on to Boyce versus Boyce in 1849. This was a more complicated case. So in this case, four houses are left on trust for Maria and Charlotte. Under the rules that Maria is supposed to choose her favorite house, and then Charlotte gets the other three. However, Maria dies before she can choose her favorite house, and the court says that the trust in favor of Charlotte is void because the subject matter and her beneficial interest, so the three houses that she is entitled to under the trust, could not be determined because we don't know which house Maria would have picked. So the policy reason behind this is that property law states that all houses are unique, um, so this would have played into the decision as well. But where there is, um, the general rule is where the beneficial interest is not ascertainable, there cannot be an express trust because it is not certain enough. Moving on to Rigole's will trust in 1965. Here the wording used is, she gets to use one of my flats and gets a reasonable income. Again, on the face, we would assume that this trust would fail due to uncertainty. However, the court decided that the executor of the will could use, uh, could choose which flat was um, given and that reasonable income would be sufficient for the court to determine objectively by um, considering the person's previous standard of living up to this point. However, this is a very unusual decision and in a problem question, we cannot blatantly state that this will be followed um, because generally it is obviously very important that there is exact certainty of subject matter, um, but it does show that in certain instances there can be exceptions. We will consider what happens if assets are part of a larger amount. and. Um, First, we'll have a look at the case of Rue London Wine in 1986. So in this case, a wine dealer told customers that wine bottles they were buying were held on trust for them, but the wine was never separated from the rest of the stock. So therefore, the court held, due to a lack of certainty, the trust failed. And this is due to the fact that it is impossible to determine which wine bottles would have been on trust and which would not. Even if it said that 50% of the wine bottles were on trust, then it could be 50%, so half of each wine bottle being on trust. It sounds illogical, but it is simply impossible to determine which parts would have been on trust and which would not, and there would be problems, for example, if some of the wine bottles had gone bad um, or some had been stolen, it would have been impossible to tell which 
um, wine bottles were stolen or bad uh, and therefore there was lack of certainty. Uh, the same happened in McJordan, um, a case in 1992. This case concerned money in a bank account um, that was supposed to be paid to builders after the completion of a construction project, but the money was never separated from the other assets of the company. And therefore, when the company went bankrupt, there was no way to say which money they were entitled to and the trust simply failed. However, there is a very deeply problematic um, decision, which is Hunter versus Moss in 1994. And this case concerns shares. So in the case, a shareholder declares that he will hold 50 of his 150, so a third of his shares on trust, but he never identifies which shares. And he also does not separate them, which he should have done by new share certificates. So the Court of Appeal, however, holds that the trust is valid, although he does nothing to separate the assets in question. And it contrasts McJordan heavily because you would think that money is also um, all the same in that respect. So overall, this case has been subject to much critique uh, and other common law jurisdictions have also not followed Hunter v. Moss, but the UK has. So in the UK, a bulk of intangible properties such as shares um, does not need to be separated in order to be held on trust. Um, so one may think that this is a good decision because intangible property is usually synonymous, but we have to remember that this does not always hold true. So for example, if after the trust is set up, it comes out that only 50% of the shares were legitimately transferred and the rest were illegitimately transferred, there is a huge problem because we don't know which ones were and which ones were not. Um, and it is important to remember that um, where there are different types of shares or from different companies, Hunter and Moss will not apply. So it only applies when the shares are the same type. So lastly, what happens if there is no certainty of subject matter? If there is lack of certainty in regard to the subject matter, the trust will simply fail. What happens when the trust fails? The property returns to the settler or his estate um, if it is a testamentary trust um, and it will result, um, go on resulting trust back to the estate or to the settler. So thank you very much for listening to me today. Um, don't forget to follow me on Instagram, uh, legally.blonde.laura. I'm also happy to answer any questions you may have in regard to this topic.